Awesome. Uh, so this is extending Spark ML. I am well aware that we are running a little bit over schedule, and I am the last talk before lunch. So I have cut this down a little more than normal. Um, but it, it will still hopefully be useful and entertaining, uh, or at least one of the two. I, I don't know if we can do both. Uh, but yeah, I'm Holden. Um, my preferred pronouns are she or her. It's, it's tattooed on my wrist. Um, and I, I work at IBM. Um, here's some links. I've, the slides from today's talk will be on SlideShare. Um, and I've got some Spark videos. There's some intro stuff on there as well if you're like new to Spark and this doesn't scare you away from Spark. Um, if it does, I mean, just don't tell my boss. It's, it's amazing. Um, oh, and I have a new book coming out this year that I'm going to try and get you all to buy several copies of. I get much better royalties on it than I did the previous books. Um, <laughs> And yeah, uh, so I added the slide after the American election, and I realize we're not in America. Um, but I'm like queer and trans, and I'm Canadian. I, I work in America on a work visa that they're talking about reforming. Um, and I also consider myself part of the leather community. Um, and if you don't know other people like me, we're here. We write the same shitty Scala code that you do. Um, <laughs> And you know we're we're not we're not stealing your jobs or anything like that. And I mean I'm in Europe, so like hopefully you all are reasonable people. But I continue to be surprised by the world. Um, so yeah, let's go back and talk about happy computer things. Um, so yeah, I work at IBM uh, in their Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. I like it a lot. Uh, we're focused on open source. Um, there's a bunch of other engineers that work there with me. Um, some of them work on Spark. Some of them work on things built on top of Spark, like System ML, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, we have this really nice lobby. It's got a bunch of green in it. I don't know. This is the mandatory slide from my boss that I have to put in all of my talks. So he accepts my expense reports, but he didn't tell me what I had to say about it. Um, so yeah, IBM's cool. Uh, <laughs> or something. If you buy mainframes or support contracts, please keep doing that. Um, my understanding is that System 360 pays my salary, uh, and System Z covers the cost of our uh, office space. Um, so please, please buy these things. Um, so I'm hoping you're all nice people. You've laughed at a lot of my shitty jokes, so it's pretty promising. Um, based on the talks today, I'm assuming if you didn't know some Scala already at this point, you would have checked out and gone over to check out the coffee, uh, which is delicious. But um, this does assume some Scala knowledge. How many people know some Apache Spark? Ooh, yay. OK. Now, how many people don't know any Apache Spark? Cool. OK. Um, so this is definitely targeted more towards the people that know some Apache Spark. Uh, if you don't know any, uh, this should still be OK to follow along with. But you're going to want to watch an intro talk from someone like Paco or something like that afterwards to sort of put this in context. Um, and I hope you think machine learning is cool. If you don't, well, it's going to be boring. Um, so we're going to look at a really fast intro into how Spark works, um, specifically the machine learning bits. We're going to build a really shitty machine learning pipeline. Um, and then we're going to build some really useless machine learning pipeline stages on top of it so that you can go and build some really cool machine learning pipeline stages in something that takes longer than like a 30-minute talk. Um, and you can make them open source, and you can make my life easier. You can contribute back to the community like everyone's been asking you to do today by making awesome machine learning stuff. Um, yeah. And if anyone has an expense account, please buy several copies of my book. Um, for the people that are new to Spark, it's really awesome. It has a Scala API and a Python API. Um, I think this is really useful for tricking people and slowly converting them to the world of Scala, because uh, the Python API works, but not as well as the Scala <laughs> API. Um, and so it's like, no, 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 the first hit's free. Well, if you want it to run really fast, <laughs> you could learn Scala. It's not that hard. Um, and then, you know. Next thing you know. Um, a lot of people come to Spark because they're like, my MapReduce job is taking 18 hours. I bet I can learn Spark in about 12 hours. Um, and sometimes they're right. Um, another one is when our problems just get too big for a single machine. We go like, oh yeah, I'm going to use Spark. That's awesome. Uh, the other way that people find it is they're like, I want a new job, and I need to put something fancy on my resume. I'm going to use Spark on kilobytes of data. Um, <laughs> And that's cool, too, because I still get to sell your company support contracts or whatever it is, or IBM does. Um, we're going to focus 
on the data frame and data set abstraction today, because it's what Spark's machine learning tools are built on top of. Um, but there is a second abstraction called resilient distributed data sets, uh, which is just the naming confusion is delightful. Yeah, software engineers should never be allowed to name things. Um, here we have the slide which indicates that there's no one who reviews my slides before I publish them, and certainly no designers working with me. Um, but we can see that there's a sort of core layer of Apache Spark, and on top of it, we've got these different libraries that are built. Um, Spark had an early machine learning thing called MLlib, uh, which was just built directly on top of the core APIs. Um, and since then, this SQL data frame and data set APIs have been introduced. And our new fancy machine learning stuff is called Spark ML, and it's built on top of the SQL and data frame APIs. Um, so if you're looking for a reason to learn the SQL and data frame APIs, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, and there's a new streaming system built on top of it. Please don't use it um, in production. Uh, I have to say the second part, otherwise TD murders me. Um, but it's not ready for use yet. But it's, it's where all of this stuff is going. Um, if you're from sort of a Python background, I don't know why you'd be at this conference, um, but you need to lower your expectations about Spark data frames. Um, or if you're ever like talking to a Python person and they get really excited about Spark data frames, you're going to want to want to let them down easily unless you hate them. Um, we can sort of think of them as semi-structured tables, which we can do crazy stuff on. Um, but we can't do all of the crazy stuff that the Python people like doing with their data frames, um, because our data frames have to be magically distributed. And uh, there's a lot more people working on pandas than Spark. Um, or there were over the, over the past while. Um, the really important part is all of the stuff is mostly automatically distributed, um, except we can, we can always force Spark to do local computation um, by calling collect. Um, and if you're using the kilobytes of data approach, go right ahead. Um, but for today's happy machine learning stuff, we're going to look at distributed fun bits. Um, and yeah, they're the input for Spark's machine learning. Um, they still, we can still do really fun functional programming on top of data frames and data sets. But there's this DSL for doing sort of more SQL-like expressions on top of data frames and data sets. And it lets the optimizer do a lot of crazy stuff um, because we can't really do code introspection on your lambdas all that well and figure out what's going on. Uh, so when you use the DSL, it gets a lot faster. Um, but you don't have to use the DSL. And honestly, I don't because I like writing functional code. Um, and other people pay for my machines. So you know, make your trade-offs as you will. Um, here's a slide trying to convince you that they're fast. Um, big is bad. So we can see there's this thing called group by key on RDDs. If you've used Spark, you've probably learned that group by key is the devil. Um, and reduced by key is not exactly the devil. It's pretty safe. Um, but we can see that data frames outperforms uh, even our intelligent operations on top of RDDs. Uh, yeah, cool. So we're going to load some data. Um, and this is kind of important. Um, we can use Spark CSV uh, if you have you know, kilobytes of data. Uh, if you have like terabytes of CSV data, that's fine too. Uh, you can just point it at HDFS, and it magically works. Um, I think my example is with JSON. It's super simple. I say load sample.json. Uh, in this case, sample.json is not terabytes of data. Um, but if it was, Spark would still go ahead and load this JSON data, and it would do schema inference on your JSON data, which for me is something which I really heart um, because pretty much everyone who's ever given me JSON data before has been lying to me about what their schema is, probably not intentionally. Um, but Spark makes it easy to be like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah, all those fields aren't null. And then you run it, and it's like, yeah, no, those fields are null. Um, and so th this is useful. Um, I think it's really useful for JSON data, but we can point it at like Parquet, Avro, whatever we want to do. Um, so we've got a data frame, and we're going to do some machine learning with it. It's going to be exciting. So what does a machine learning pipeline in Spark look like? Um, so after their first attempt with making Spark ML, uh, we learned that you actually need to do things besides just loading your data and giving it directly to a classifier to train on. Um, 
you, you have to do things like tokenize your data. And when you ask people to give you all of your fields as doubles, like you're going to have to do some other things too. Um, so we have all of these different pipeline stages to sort of do data preparation. Um, and a lot of the data preparation stages are called transformer stages. And these stages don't require training. Um, so we can think of like hashing TF, uh, English tokenizer, or really anything with spaces where we don't have to train a model on our tokenization. Um, if you're tokenizing Chinese, you're good luck. Um, and estimators are the things which require training. Um, and so some of our things which are still doing feature preparation, like the string indexer is still like, we wouldn't consider string indexing machine learning per se, but it has to be an estimator because it has to be trained on our data. Um, and then we have Naive Bayes, which is obviously an estimator. It's our fancy machine learning tool, except it's not really all that fancy. There's a really nice closed form. Um, and so we build our pipeline, then we fit our pipeline on this data that we just loaded, and it gives us back this transformer that I can use to predict new records. Um, I think it's cool and useful. Um, if you wanted to make a pipeline of pipelines, you can because of the way how the types work out. Please don't. Um, it will go poorly for you. Uh, yeah, we're going to start with building a string indexer together. Um, and then I do have a part where we build naive bays together, but we're not going to do that today. It's in the bonus slides. Um, but we're, we'll build some other stuff too. Um, so doing really simple data prep in Spark, we've got our data frame with some probably textual data in it, probably some doubles in it because I'm really lazy. Um, and I need to get it into a form that I can train on. Um, and that involves getting it into these vectors, uh, which we really shouldn't have called vector um, because that was kind of taken. Um, but we just you know, rename imports, yay Scala. Um, so really, really simple a vector assembler just says like these are my fields, put them together in a vector so Spark can train on these fields. Um, the string indexer says like look at this category string, uh, look at this column uh, called category. It's going to be a bunch of strings. Find out what the different strings are and assign them numerical values um, based on how frequently they occur. And then we put this together into a really crappy pipeline. Um, and we set our stages, and we've got our pipeline to do our data preparation. Uh, then we go ahead, and we fit our pipeline, and then we can, we can make our prepared data that we want to train on. Um, in reality, you probably need to do a lot more than just shove two doubles together. Uh, you're going to have a lot of other stages that you're going to be putting in there, but you're all just going to you're just going to make that array longer, and it'll be fine. Um, and then we can take this. We can make a decision tree classifier. Um, I very creatively named my features column features. Um, and we're going to set our prediction column to prediction, and we're just going to fit our model. And now I can predict, I think the sample is with like US adults who make more than $50,000. So we can predict like which kind of people are going to make money based on some other random feature. Um, but really the better way to do it would be to have our pipeline have all of our stages in it. So we don't like have a separate data preparation pipeline and a model training pipeline. We can put our model into the pipeline and train it all in one go. Um, you know, it's nice, simple. We can just add more things to our pipeline. But now, let's say that I've at least convinced you to play around with Spark's machine learning. Um, but you found that like whichever random data preparation tool you want isn't available. So now you have to build your own data preparation tool. Um, you could do it so that if we go back here. You'd like fit like half of a pipeline, do a bunch of custom code, and fit another half of a pipeline. But that's kind of ugly, right? We would much rather have all of our stuff be together. Um, and not only is it kind of ugly, it, it limits what we can do with our meta algorithms. Uh, so we're going to look at trying to make this all go together. And you're going to make your own pipeline stage. It's going to be awesome. And you're going to post it on GitHub, hopefully. Uh, oh, we're also going to predict the results, but whatever. Yay, pipeline. It's a cat. Oh, I forgot to introduce my co-speaker, Boo. This is Boo. Her name is Boo. She likes Scala. Um, she also likes Python, though. She's not a very discerning dog. Um, I like Python, too, for, for the Python people in the audience. I'm, I, I like pretty much all programming languages except for x86 assembly, which I've got some issues with. 
Um, but so the other reason why we want to use these pipelines is that Spark has this really nice cross-validation tool. Um, and I can use this to sort of tune the different parameters that are going to be in my pipeline, right? Um, if I was doing some type of n-gram thing to create one of my features, or if I had some type of smoothing parameter, or a maximum decision tree height, these are all things that I might want to tune about my machine learning pipeline. And I didn't do very well at statistics, uh, so I'm going to have the computer do that for me in a completely unprincipled way. Um, and yeah, I'm going to build this parameter grid. I'm going to say, Spark, go find my happy parameters for me. And then I'm going to pretend that this was definitely principled and I passed my statistics classes in university. Uh, well, I did, because in Canada, 50 is a pass. But you know, we'll pretend that I passed them well um, and, and I didn't use this parameter grid search. But this is really useful to be able to do, and we can only do this on our pipelines when all of our stages are together. Otherwise, we have to like do a bunch of manual work to do this parameter search. Um, yeah, and, and save a test set beforehand, otherwise your results are garbage, um, but just please save a test set. Um, right, so you, ah, there's a really good chance that you don't actually need to build an ML pipeline stage. Uh, there are a lot of ML pipeline stages available for you. That being said, I think building an ML pipeline stage is fun, and if your boss asks me, I will say that it's very important you build your ML pipeline stage. And if you tell me what you're building in advance, I'll tell them it's very, I'll tell them it's very important for whatever it is you're building. I will definitely back you up uh, when you tell them it's going to take a month to build this custom pipeline stage, and it's super important for business reasons. Um, I find I can convince people about business reasons more easily in email than in person, uh, so please have your boss email me. Do not introduce me to them at a conference. Um, but like, this is an excuse to go and sort of play around with Spark for a week or two and build your own cool ML pipeline stage. And I think that's really fun. Um, and honestly, I think that's enough of a business reason, but there's probably a reason I'm not a manager. Um, and yeah, so there's a bunch of feature stages as well. Um, I think probably if you're, if you're looking at building something in Spark and you can only convince your boss for like a week or two of free time, uh, building a feature stage is the way to go. Um, but if you, you know, can convince your boss that you've got like two months for this very important business thing, like go right ahead, build your own custom classifier. Um, so adventure time! This is Miffy. I didn't bring her with me, but she likes flowers. I think she's Dutch. Anyways, okay. Um, so estimators and transformers, we're going to start with building a transformer. Um, and part of that is because if we want to build an estimator, our estimators need to return transformers once they've been fit on the data anyways. So even if you're like, yeah, I'm going to take a month, we'll start with the thing that's going to take you a week. Um, so we have to have this transform schema. Um, and this part, like, I always feel bad about it when I talk to Scala people. Um, you might have noticed that we were working on these things called data frames, and there wasn't really any type parameter on data frame. Uh, and there is this like really typed version called data sets in Spark. Um, but we don't use it for the machine learning API, because that was like a lot of work. Um, <laughs> and so instead, we have this other thing, which is also a lot of work but didn't look like a lot of work when we started. Um, <laughs> so we use transform schema to, at runtime, check the schemas of the types that are passed in and sort of pass down what we expect our schema output is going to be to the next step so that we can do at least like kind of type checking at runtime, but like instead of failing in the middle of an eight hour job, if your types don't line up, we'll fail at the start of your eight hour job, but we're still gonna fail when you run rather than at compile time, so I'm sorry. Um, it's not my fault per se, but if you wanna blame someone, <gasps> you can blame Boo. Yeah, don't blame Boo, she's nice. Um, so, there's some boilerplate that we have to put in. It's not super important. You can just pretend that you're like a transformer from the Transformers, and this is the start of your transforming song. Um, and so this is the magic transforming song that you have to put at the start of every transformer. Um, yeah. 
And then we need to do some input validation. Uh, in this case, it's really easy. I'm just checking to make sure that my schema has some information about how many pandas are happy, uh, because if it doesn't, I don't want to process that data. Um, and then I'm going to add some output about how many pandas are happy. Huh. This seemed more useful when I made it. It's not, but whatever. So we, we take our input schema. We, val we validate it has what we need, and we say this is the information that I'm going to be adding after my stage is finished. Um, normally, we do this with schema.add. Uh, if you're going to drop things, that's OK, but that's not normal. Um, so we tend to get records of megabytes, which is super efficient. Um, but yeah, so you, you normally just say what data you're adding. Uh, you could specify a completely different schema if you were doing something crazy. Um, so what are we going to do with our transformer? That's a good question. OK, cool. Yeah, so when we call fit on the pipeline, it goes ahead and it says, like, this is my input data frame. This is what my data frame looks like. And then it just passes the schema information down to each of the stages to make sure everything is going to work out probably. Um, Note that it doesn't always work that way because software. Um, but yeah, so that's cool. Uh, and now we're going to do our work. So we've, we've done our schema stuff so that Spark can tell what's going on and do some really simple type checking. Um, but this is the mandatory sort of word count example that must be in every big data talk. Um, and this is actually slimmed down word count. We, we just count the number of words in total. It's really shitty. But um, as a licensed big data instructor, they told me if I didn't put word count in, they were going to take away my big data license. Um, and that's why it's in all of these talks about big data. It's a licensing requirement. The government, you know. Um, eh, that normally gets more laughs in America. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we do our word count, and this is, this is our transformer. Um, essentially, this is the part where you put in your, your business logic or like digging around with Spark for a week. Um, all goes inside of this transform function, whatever fun stuff you want to do. Um, but that wasn't really cool. It was hard coded. There were no parameters to do a parameter search across. I want to do a parameter search. Um, so let's add some parameters to our, to our model. Let's make it configurable. Um, here's some string parameters. Finally, hey, look, types. Yay! Um, you can have parameters of doubles and other things like that for things like smoothing parameters. And you can configure it with these set functions. And it's really nice. There's this thing called sharedparams.scala in Spark, which for some reason is marked private. Uh, and so you'll go in there, and you'll copy whichever piece of code you want out of it. Or you just say that you're making your pipeline stage inside of org.apache.spark, like I do. Oh, crap, there's a camera. Fuck. OK. Um, <clears throat> I don't do that. Uh, anyways, um, so why do we want to make our stuff configurable this way, right? Like, this feels like I'm making a Java class, right? Like, I wrote a bunch of getters and setters. I feel like a bad human. And I should. Um, but it's important to allow the meta algorithms to work on it. It needs to be done in a way that they can do their like random reflection and, and figure out what's going on. And so doing it this way makes it really easy for the Spark developers to do their thing. And so we have to do it the way which makes their lives easier, not the way which makes my life happy. Um, and this is fine. Yeah, we can, we can be evil people if you're OK with being evil. Um, I'm sure. There's someone in America hiring. Um, yeah, cool. So that was a really boring transformer. Now we're going to make a really boring estimator. Um, and you're going to replace everything inside of train with really, really cool things when you go home, right? Anyone? No. OK, well, whatever. Some of you might, maybe. Um, OK, cool. So what does, our trans what does our estimator look like? We get this little fit function. Uh, we still have the transform schema, so Spark can do its validation. Um, and it's important that we have that on the estimator so that it, it can do the validation without having to train first. Um, we import some random implicits. And I make a string index. OK, so this isn't super exciting. But you know, we could do like naive bays inside of here. We could have some type of like gradient descent algorithm inside of here. Really, whatever you want to do goes inside of this little fit function. And then you can put it into this machine learning pipeline. And you can compare it against the built-in ones from Spark. So you can see if your custom you know, week slash month of business logic outperforms some off-the-shelf open source code from some kids in Berkeley. Um, 
I'll be honest, my money's on the kids in Berkeley. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's cool. Um, yeah, nah, syntax. If, if anyone actually is gonna implement it, um, there's, there's some syntactical sugar that we have implemented. But if you're all just like, well, this sounds interesting, I'm just gonna build machine learning pipelines, you, the syntactical sugar is stuff that can just go in one ear and go out the other. Um, and here, here's what our friend the transformer looks like. Uh, we have this label index, which we constructed in the previous step. Um, so the words thing is passed in as an array rather than a parameter because this isn't actually something we want the users to configure. This is something that we compute. Um, so we don't have to do it with that weird parameter thing. We can just do it with a regular case class parameter or class parameter. Uh, and then I have my transform function, which does my model prediction. Um, and that's really awesome and basic. No one seems impressed. I'm really sad. Um, OK, so Boo did find a bunch of candy. And it looks like she's going to eat it, so we're going to wrap up quickly so you can still go and get some candy uh, or whatever food is. Um, so how do we make our train function, right? Like if you want to do something really cool, the answer is it's probably not something that can fit in a 20-minute, 30-minute talk. Um, you're probably going to have to go read some papers about whichever machine learning algorithm you want to implement. Um, honestly, I find reading the papers way easier than trying to read the Fortran code that came with the papers. That shit is not easy to read. Um, but if you're a Fortran programmer, you can go read a bunch of Fortran code and port it to Scala. Um, and if you are, I would like to know you, Fortran programmer that also knows Scala. Is there anyone in the house? Anyone? <gasps> OK. We will be friends slash I will try and steal all of your knowledge later on. Um, dibs. Uh, so you can write your own custom optimizer. Alternatively, um, Seth, who used to work at IBM, but unfortunately left us for Cloudera, and I will never forgive him for this until I leave IBM. Um, not that that's planned. Ooh. Uh, but you know, Seth has some interesting work around pluggable optimizers. So if you just can have a cost function, you can grab one of the pluggable optimizers from Seth, and you can actually just have it like do the do the optimization for you. Um, if there's a closed form solution, yay, whatever, that's great. Just write your transformer and have a party. Um, you can do a lot of other things with ML pipeline stages. Um, in theory, there's persistence that's supported in Spark. I really encourage you not to use the provided persistence layer because it's a piece of shit. Um, it writes out to like Par it's Parquet or Avro with like a random JSON schema attached to it, and like no other system in the world can read those. And I'm pretty sure Spark can't even read some of its models that it writes. Um, so. I write your own persistence layer uh, instead. Um, if anyone has to do serving, um, it's one of the little not so well kept secrets in Spark. Serving is painful. Um, you are probably going to have a much better time writing a custom persistence layer uh, to PMML or whatever format your serving system can already understand, and then just loading it back in your serving system. If you don't have a serving system, I'm sure IBM Global Business Services would be happy to make one for you. Uh, alternatively, you know that's another month of fun, like pressing around buttons on the computer. Um, there's also some random open source projects. Uh, okay, cool. So you put your code on GitHub, yay! Is anyone actually going to do this? Anyone? <sighs> Fine. OK, well, I hope you at least use machine learning so that this was somewhat useful. Um, if anyone like changes their mind, like email me. I like having friends uh, besides my stuffed animals. <laughs> Boo just is not really doing a good job. She's not pulling her weight on the generalized linear regression model I want to build with her. Um, she's lovely otherwise. OK. If anyone's like really interested in learning about how it works but maybe isn't going to build this on their own, um, I have this O'Reilly blog post you can read about. The Spark API documentation continues to exist and contain about the same amount of information as always. Um, and there are the models inside of Spark. Um, honestly, I think the best documentation for most of Spark, unfortunately, is the Spark source code. So yeah, that's fun. Um, oh, wait, no, the best documentation is this book, which is coming soon. Um, High Performance Spark. 
Uh, here's, here's other Spark books. I don't receive as much money for these Spark books, so let's focus on this one. Um, there is, chapter nine has some bits on how to extend ML if anyone changes their mind, but it has a lot of other things in it as well because extending ML does not appear to be in anyone's wheelhouse. Um, and you can buy it from O'Reilly today. They won't ship it to you because it doesn't exist, um, but you can still buy it. And that is the important part because I receive royalties on pre-sales. Um, in theory, it should be finished somewhere between May 22nd and June 18th. Um, in practice, my editor does not know where I live anymore, so this may take a bit longer as she cannot physically threaten me. Um, but if you want to give me your email address to selectively contact in compliance with whatever EU regulations there are around spam, um, hyperformancespark.com, uh, and I will let you know when it's available. Um, and I'm going to be at a bunch of other conferences, including uh, Scala Swarm um, and Scala Days Copenhagen. And if anyone's looking for an excuse to come to San Francisco, Spark Summit West is happening uh, in San Francisco, and we can, we can go out and party. Um, does anyone ride scooters? Sorry. Scooters? Yes. Yeah, wait, okay. You should come to San Francisco and we can ride scooters. <laughs> okay, um, really though, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, there's a bunch of bonus slides if anyone's like really interested in seeing how to build other types of models, but I don't think that's, I think everyone's gonna choose food over seeing how to build other types of models. Uh, yeah, food is the option. Okay, cool. So thank you all for coming. Um, I hope someone does this. <laughs> and if not, I mean, I hope you just use Spark Machine Learning. And if you don't use that either, I mean, just tell my boss you did. Uh, I really like getting paid. It's pretty awesome. Uh, to be fair, I get paid salary. Anyways, so thank you. <laughs>